My name's Alyssa Lucas, and you're listening to The Gulf, a podcast that shares stories of people and nature on the Texas Gulf Coast. I was going to start this episode with a joke about grass, but with so much to get into today, I decided to weed it out. Seed grasses. They're just like the grass in your yard, or whatever makes it through the cracks of the sidewalk, but as the name entails, it just so happens to grow underwater. And like other topics in our watershed series, sea grasses rely on freshwater inflow and clean water coming into the coast. Most of us probably encounter some form of grass every single day. Due to our familiarity with grass, sea grasses likely seem unimportant, and even a bit boring. Why should we care about sea grasses when they can't compare to the beauty of crystal green waters or colorful coral reefs? However, on closer inspection, these grassy fields must remain for us to keep our beautiful Gulf Coast waters. On this episode of the Gulf Podcast, we're going to discuss the overlooked ecosystem that our future depends on. We'd love for you to stick around and learn more. Let's dig into it. Before we start, I'd like to let you know that the Watershed series of the Gulf Podcast is supported by the Hart Research Institute for Gulf Mexico Studies at Texas A&M University Corpus Christi. HRI integrates marine science with expertise in policy, social sciences, and economics, and brings together the leading minds across the United States, Mexico, and Cuba. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast, however, may not represent the views and opinions of the Hart Research Institute or Texas A&M University Corpus Christi. Yeah, so seagrasses, um, that's a good question. So it's fun to talk about seagrasses. Meet Dr. Ken Dunn, an avid swimmer, ocean lover, and an expert on seagrasses and marine plants in general. When he isn't in the Arctic, near the polar bears, working on his other projects, he's here in Texas, unlocking the mysteries of the seagrasses and working as a professor at the University of Texas Marine Science Institute in the Department of Marine Sciences. When it comes to these kind of plants, he's the one to ask. As simple as seagrasses may seem, there were a lot scientists didn't know when he began. I did a lot of reading and started figuring out how to work with these plants and some of the big questions surrounding them. So some of the big questions about seagrasses at the time, especially here in Texas, was there was a lot of concern about where they are and what caused their losses and, and also um, recoveries. People didn't really understand you know, what their requirements were in terms of their physiological requirements. With so much unknown, Dr. Dutton set out to learn what was needed for the continued survival of seagrasses. After all, how can you preserve something when you don't even know what it needs to thrive? Before diving into the numerous questions behind seagrasses and the fight for their survival, it's first important to understand what seagrasses are. So in the world, Right now, there's about a quarter million flowering plants, 250,000 flowering plants, species. Of that quarter of a million plants, flowering plants, how many do you think have invaded the marine environment and live underwater? It's not very many. It's about 50 to 60. Total, those plants in the ocean are called seagrasses. Now, we do have plants that would grow in freshwater environments that live underwater. But they're not seagrasses, and there's not very many species of those either. Um, plants that can truly live deep underwater, rooted, and are mostly in the marine environment, or a lot of them are in the marine environment, and those are seagrasses. So seagrasses have true, they have roots, they have leaves, they have short stems even, but mostly they're, they're grasses. Just like grasses, they grow in your front lawn. And of those species, there are only about five in Texas. So why do so few flowering plants, also known as endosperms, call the ocean home? Because they grow in the marine environment, they have to have a, some major adaptations to get, how they get there? First of all, they gotta be able to be rooted, right? They have to somehow root to the marine sediments. They have to tolerate salt. That's, that's a big deal, tolerate salt. They have to somehow produce oxygen and get it down to the roots and rhizomes. Because the roots and rhizomes have to respire. They're not photosynthetic. So how do you keep the roots and rhizomes that are in a anoxic environment, low oxygen sediments? Sexual reproduction is another challenge that these plants have to overcome. And, and so that's why there's only 50 or 60 species. Besides these unique needs that seagrasses have to meet, they also have to meet the regular needs of every plant, with one of the most important being light. However, the main question was, just how much light do these plants need? Not even the Texas State Aquarium knew. 
The Texas State Aquarium was being built at the time. They wanted to have live seagrasses. They didn't know how much light to give them. And, and I was one of the things that they came to me and said, how much light do we need to have? I said, they need a lot of light. Probably so much light that it's going to be a problem. While light is plentiful above the surface, due to water quality and other factors, it's becoming increasingly difficult for the light to reach down to the depths of the seagrass beds. So, how did Dr. Dunn learn about the needs of seagrasses and their light requirements? Well, it didn't just happen in a lab. So, that meant having equipment that I could deploy underwater, right? I had to build chambers. I had to run a lot of wires from the chambers to the surface on a boat that was well anchored. You know, I had to have pumps circulating the water in the chambers. I had to make sure that I could measure oxygen, dissolved oxygen, which is a product of photosynthesis in the chambers. And I had to purge those chambers every so often with nitrogen because the oxygen values would get so high, super saturated, that I would have to let the oxygen out, drop the oxygen concentrations again so I could measure what was going on. I had to measure respiration at night. And I wanted to do this, as I said, in situ, in other words, uh, not in the lab. So that led to some pretty fun projects because we would take a boat down to Low Laguna Madre, a big boat, and we would anchor it up and just set up a very sophisticated experiment over several days. And we would, storms would come in, storms would come, storms would go, um, the winds would blow, the rains would come, and we would just sit out there dutifully collecting data, uh, diving all night long, collecting, you know, watching these chambers. By gathering this information throughout the year, Camping out multiple days at a time, Dr. Dunn was able to get data that painted a clearer picture of their needs, and more specifically, what was preventing them from being met. Throughout the season, we have discussed the importance of water quality, and how this must be maintained so the ecosystem remains healthy for all the life within it. While there are a couple reasons why seagrass ecosystems are dying out, the main one is because they can't get enough light. And a big reason for why this is, is due to water quality issues. We have those, those types of anthropogenic activities. We have nutrient loading and algal blooms, another anthropogenic man-caused perturbation. But we also have our natural system, though, is also by its very nature turbid because we have rivers coming into the ocean. Rivers are carrying suspended particulate matter, so the water becomes turbid. It's high in organic matter and, and inorganic matter that's suspended in the water column. And when you have that suspended organic matter, it attenuates light. So as the light is attenuated in the water column, less reaches the bottom, depending on how much is suspended in, in the water. So obviously, when you have um, deeper water depths, the less light reach in the bottom. And at some point, there's not enough for seagrasses. When it comes to understanding the impacts of algal blooms and nutrient loading, it's first important to understand the role freshwater inflow plays into those things. Freshwater inflow usually goes up in rainy periods and decreases in seasons of drought. While more freshwater inflow can be a good thing, in areas that have a lot of agriculture, it can carry fertilizers which leads to nutrient loading and causes seagrasses to struggle to obtain the correct amounts of ammonium and properly grow roots. On the other hand, phytoplankton thrive on these nutrients and then grow to such a degree it shades out other plants growing beneath and prevents them from getting light. Considering all the human activity along Baffin Bay, Nutrient loading is common, and these phytoplankton blooms and brown tides happen quite regularly, which is why it's one of the areas we're seeing a loss of seagrasses. However, a lack of freshwater inflow isn't much better. This leads to high levels of salinity, which affects the overall productivity of sea vegetation. So when it comes to freshwater inflow, there needs to be a balance. On the other hand, dredging is another major reason why plants aren't getting the light that they need. We have lost grasses associated with dredging activities. So we maintain the ICWW, the Intercoastal Waterway. The Corps of Engineers dredges the ICWW on a regular basis, and that, and that causes seagrass loss because they dredge. Um, they deposit their dredge materials along the side of the ICWW, and those materials end up in the water column. They get eroded, and they decrease the light penetration of the water column. The dredging itself doesn't take very long, but the problem is, is that when they deposit their dredge materials, it constantly erodes and erodes over a long period of time and creates extended periods of low water column transparency. 
So it's different places in the state. There's a lot of loss, like I said, up north, and there's some loss down here at the deeper waters, and there's losses along the ICWW, which is Laguna Madre, mostly. However, even clear waters doesn't necessarily mean that seagrasses are able to get enough light. More recent we've come in, change sea level rise. So what we've discovered is that we're losing grass beds in Texas because the depths and water levels are rising. When water levels rise, that means grasses that are growing in a depth that is safe now and there's, there's sufficient light, and now in depths that there's not sufficient light because the water has gotten deeper. So less light is penetrating to the seabed. And so that is something that we didn't anticipate happening so quickly, but it is happening now. Sea level rise has accelerated on the Texas Gulf Coast and on the Gulf Coast in general for a variety of reasons, but we're seeing the impacts of that now. So the question is, where are they going to go? If you're losing seagrasses, can they migrate shoreward and into water, into areas that were once dry, now becoming wet? Maybe, maybe not. It all depends on what we refer to as hardened shoreline. So it's because of urbanization, we built bulkheads and we built walls to protect streets and roads and houses, you know, that means that there's no place for them to migrate inland. They can't because those hardened shorelines. So the, let, the net is a net loss of grass beds because they have nowhere to go. Due to the consequences of hard shorelines, this is why it's more ideal to have something known as living shorelines. This means that instead of seagrasses being concrete or urbanization when they try to spread, they can be areas where there's still room for them to grow into, even as sea levels rise. The depletion of seagrasses may not sound severe, but this is a crucial part of the ecosystem, and it doesn't take a scientist to notice what's happening. You may remember from past episodes that fishermen in Baffin Bay have talked about how the waters just aren't what they used to be. They know that where there used to be grasses, there's now either none or just some leftover mush, and that's really affecting the fishery. Seagrasses act as an important ecosystem and food source. They're also extremely helpful in providing fish a way to hide from predators. So if you're a small larval, larvae or larva, or you are a small fish and you need to hide from predators, you're going to go to a seagrass bed. And seagrass beds are quiet because the grasses, they have so much air in them because they're photosynthesizing. They produce a lot of bubbles. Bubbles attenuate sound. So as one of my grad students pointed out, seagrass beds are like libraries. They're really quiet. And you know what else? Because they're like libraries and have all those bubbles in their blades, it's very difficult for predators like, like dolphins that use sonar to locate fish to hunt. And just like trees, seagrasses play an important part in storing carbon that helps prevent the greenhouse effect. So in a sense, seagrasses do their part in a high CO2 atmosphere where we're trying to sequester carbon and reduce the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. Having seagrasses capture that carbon and, and basically put it away in storage is a very, very good thing. And so anything we can do by losing grass beds, we're just making the problem even worse, recycling even more carbon back into the atmosphere. Not only is this decline bad for the environment, but it can also be detrimental to the economies of coastal cities and towns along the Gulf. And not to mention the fact that who's going to come down to Texas and spend money if there's no fish to catch? So the economy is really, really built around a healthy marine environment. How are you going to maintain this vibrant economy if people are not going to come down here because the the system's polluted, you can't catch fish, and uh, there's no beach left? What are you going to do? Beach nourishment and and maintaining our beaches and our estuaries so that that all these activities can continue to allow people to come to the coast and enjoy themselves. So we really have to think carefully about how we're developing our, our coastlines or not developing our coastlines. In past decades, more emphasis has been put on protecting and restoring these seagrass ecosystems. With the help of organizations such as Texas Parks and Wildlife, the Texas Commission of Environmental Equality, and the General Land Office, a conservation plan known as the Seagrass Conservation Plan for Texas, or SCPT, has been developed. One aspect of this conservation plan is educating boaters on actions that can be harmful to seagrass beds. People would take their boats in to go fishing, and those outboard engines would create deep scars in grass beds and destroy them. 
those deep trenches that were made by props would become a, a conduit, become an erosional surface. It would become an area that would get deeper and deeper because of currents and, and seagrasses would not grow in there. And, and worse than that, there's problems with suspended sediments and an exchange of nutrients and, and carbon. And it was slowly destroying a lot of the grass beds. Well, that changed both with education by Texas Parks and Wildlife on the, on the dangers to grass beds by crop scarring, but also through technology. So now they're building boats with engines that either have a, either use jet engines or they have shallow draft boats in which the engines are able to work in much shallower water and not dredge the bottom. And so there's been a lot of positive developments over the last few years. So now prop scarring is not as a big a problem as it once was. Another change which can help prevent loss of seagrasses is changing the time which dredging occurs. Dr. Dunn found that in the wintertime, the temperature over the water was about 10 to 12 degrees centigrade, or degrees in Celsius. This translates to about 50 to 53.6 degrees in Fahrenheit. It turns out that this colder water has quite an impact on the plants. No matter how much light you gave seagrasses, if the water was cold, they wouldn't do anything. They just shut down at cold temperatures. So that led us to a recommendation to the state that dredging activities should really take place in the wintertime because they would have much less of an impact on the grasses than during the summer. While these changes are good, it won't be enough to save the seagrasses if more isn't done. New solutions are needed, and change takes time. That's why Dr. Dunn is putting his trust in future generations of scientists. And, and, and that's my job now is to empower grad students to dig into these uh, issues and think about new ways to solve these problems. You need fresh minds, creative minds that can think outside the box, right? That's why I love having grad students because they're thinking more creatively than I can think now because I've been doing this for a long time. And so I have certain ways I solve problems. But there are lots of different ways to solve problems. And having that fresh perspective that a grad student brings in, where the, basically the whole world is their playground, and they have a lot of energy. And, and I love that energy. And to put that energy to work in terms of solving some of these big issues that, that we really have to address. It may be true that the topic of seagrass ecosystems is a bit mundane when compared to things like sharks or giant squids. But that doesn't make them any less important. We would not have the Gulf Coast that we know without seagrasses, and it's about time to get the credit they deserve. So, next time you're in the water, take note of the vegetation and see if you notice any grasses. But this time, imagine them the way you do prairie fields or grassy valleys. Could you imagine those ecosystems being without grasses? Our shores aren't too much different in their need for them. Anyways, I hope your grass, bing, what I'm trying to say. Sorry, sorry, that's less my puns, I promise. This has been Alyssa Lucas for the Gulf Podcast. Thanks for listening.